Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back David Leonhardt and panelists Nicholas Dirks, Michael McRobbie, and Nancy Zimfer. Thank you all for coming. So we have represented here three of the biggest and best of our public flagships. Um, uh, and I want to start a little bit where we started yesterday, which is I know you all in different ways are thinking about this question of how to get kids to succeed. Um, and Chancellor Zimfer, I'm going to start with you because I know SUNY's really engaged with this. I talked about this last night. We've got a lot of colleges with graduation rates that when you look at them, you sort of wonder, wait a second, why is the graduation rate 60? Uh, why is it 55? Why in some cases is it 40? Some of the best places, why is it only 80? Um, why aren't graduation rates higher? And um, even though a lot of that problem, I think, comes from K-12 and a lot of it comes from lack of funding, what can higher education itself do to try to improve the situation? Well, um, I don't do well with higher education itself. You know, I'm really committed to the relationship between early childhood, K-12, and higher ed. And a lot of the challenge is the pipeline leaks from the very beginning, and we don't take the opportunities to fix a, a, a learning problem when it occurs. Thus, we invent this thing called remediation, which is a trap door for students. You go into remediation, the more of it you take, the less likelihood you are to graduate. So I think, uh, and, and I think the mayor could have talked about this because he's been very supportive of a cradle to career, starting with early childhood, making sure kids come to kindergarten ready to learn, staying at it at every point along the way. Um, when we don't do that, we get what SUNY has um, been challenged with for quite a while, which is millions of dollars spent on remediation and it's still not a gateway to success. So I think the answer to the question is we have to be smarter about what works. We have to be very focused in using approaches to math pathways and to online advising and to uh, how to help students know how to pay for college. And we have to collect data. We have to use evidence-based strategies. But more important, and this is something that SUNY can do because it's big, we have to weed out what's not working, the thousand points of light that everybody loves because they've always done it that way. Use some form of continuous improvement to stick with the things that work and then take what works to scale. I think we can bump our numbers significantly and we've made a very public pledge to the state of New York that we will increase our 93,000 degrees to 150,000 over the next five years doing primarily one thing, being very clear about what we're doing that works and making sure what works is accessible to all students. That has not been the case. We've been very, all of us, really fixated on access and we forgot to pick up the other thread, which is, are you getting through the pipeline? And of course, I, I really think universities have to pay a lot more attention to how they prepare teachers because it's the teachers who teach the students who come to college ready or not and we have 5,000 teachers we prepare a year. So I see it as an ecosystem. I see it as evidence-based. And I see using this kind of collective uh, thought pattern and collective intervention as a way to take success to scale. And finally, finally begin to move the dial. So weeding out what doesn't work is a little tricky with the way a university is set up, right? You don't get to go around and just say, that doesn't work, you're all fired, right? right. For better and worse. Um, how do you actually, given the realities of shared governance, given the realities of tenure, uh, how do you actually weed out what doesn't work? Well, um, uh, what you say is exactly right. I, you, you, it's not like in business or industry where you can say, we don't want this division anymore and, and get rid of it. I mean, it, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, we've, we've focused very much on uh, trying to fundamentally reform the whole academic structure of uh, our university, in particular the two main research campuses in Bloomington, Indianapolis, which is uh, two-thirds of the total university. Um, and what, what we're focused on is um, re both reforming and uh, transforming the restructuring uh, a number of our schools. We have about 20, 24 schools across those campuses 
in the last four years, we've created um, either eight new schools from the ground up uh, through merger uh, or through um, other mechanisms. And so, for example, I mean, just one example, um, we're very much focused on trying to have these schools focused on what are uh, the key opportunities for employment for graduates in the professional areas. In your own area, we had um, a separate school of journalism, a separate uh, department of communication and culture, a separate film studies program, and a separate department of telecommunications, all different parts of the university all competing with each other, all seeing their enrolments start to fall because there was not the uh, commonality of courses across those. We, um, we merged all of those into a new media school, single school, common curriculum across um, all, those, all those units. And that's been, a, that's been a theme that we've used or a mechanism we've used in a variety of other areas. Indiana has sadly some of the worst public health statistics in, uh, in the country. We mm. rank in the 40s in most areas of public health. We transformed two schools, sorry, one school and then a department from another, from another um, uh, school uh, who were um, both uh, developed in the, in the 40s when uh, health and recreation schools were uh, then in vogue. They were the public health schools of their day. We've converted those into schools of public health and got both of them accredited this year. Why does Indiana, this is an aside, but why does Indiana have such bad public health? Is it consistent with income or is its public health even worse than income? Uh, I, I, it, it's probably consistent with income. I okay. mean, that, that's probably part of the, part of the connection. President Crow talked last night on stage about these different waves of universities, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when he was talking and he said, look, we've basically had almost no new big public universities in a century, I was thinking that's right. Uh, the exceptions are in your state, right? Uh, UC Irvine, which I wrote about in this morning's paper, is a remarkably new university in the, in the scope of American universities. It's about 50 years old. Can you look 50 years ahead, um, uh, and we won't hold you to this, uh, uh, and tell us what you think is reasonable to think about how much is going to change. I find it hard to believe that the next 50 years won't involve substantially more change in higher education than the last 100. But I also am really wary of any argument that basically is the future is going to be different from the past. Well, you know, I'm a historian. I have to confess by uh, disciplinary background and training. So even thinking about tomorrow is difficult for me. But uh, 50 years out. Uh, indeed. I mean, uh, I thought uh, Mike Crow did a great job of actually laying out the schematic history of American higher education and, uh, and of course, the University of California and its Berkeley uh, 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 moment of creation in 1868 was part of phase three. It was also part of phase four in the creation of the American Research University. Uh, and uh, it has, in fact, of course, continued to adapt. It hasn't been exactly standing still since uh, all those uh, four waves were set in place by the late 19th or early 20th centuries. Uh, and it's, 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 it's developed and adapted in part through uh, an articulation of, set of a set of understandings about the interconnectedness of different parts of the system. And to some extent, the State University of New York reflects right. some of the kinds of things that were developed in post-war California around the master plan, the establishment of this idea that, of course, was also an idea that was going to be funded by the state of California. Uh, an idea that was created as a partnership between the <laughs> chancellor and then president of the University of California, Clark Kerr, and the governor, Pat Brown, uh, that, uh, that would create a system in which you would have community colleges, California state universities, and then some of the finest research universities in the world, uh, all funded, all uh, uh, supported, but all interconnected. Uh, and to this day, the master plan is observed in the sense that even at the University of California, Berkeley, routinely ranked as the number one public university in the country, uh, and when ranked on the basis of research rather than in U.S. News and World Report, often put in the top five universities globally, still takes close to a third of its students as transfer students from California community colleges. So you have uh, a pipeline that is not just a theory, but a reality. Now, the problem, of course, is that here we are 50, 60 years after the master plan, and we are 55, and we are uh, uh, in some sense stuck. Uh, we have uh, gotten to a point at the University of California, Berkeley, where we have only 17% of our applicants getting in. Uh, we're beginning to have the same levels of selectivity that, uh, that the elite privates have. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there are more and more problems about everything from access to community college to access at every one of those articulation points in the system. 
And that, of course, is where a lot of people have tried to step in with online, with different kinds of uh, uses of technology, with, uh, with hopes to uh, create free community college. Uh, and indeed, I think with uh, recognition of the fact that there is something deeply broken, not only in the educational system, but in the social and economic uh, structures that, of course, with enhanced uh, inequality and, uh, and, and growing challenges, uh, made that kind of dream and in a way, it was the American dream as close as we can have it. Uh, and to some extent, in California, as you showed in the morning's paper, still is, is still vastly insufficient for the numbers of students who are going to need not only education, not only to graduate, but also access to the very best universities in America. And that kind of issue, I think, is one that uh, we in California are worried a lot about. We insist that you can have access and, ac and excellence. But what we really are concerned about, certainly in a flagship university, is that there be access to excellence. And not just through the great private colleges and the great private universities, which do fabulous jobs, and we heard about that last night. But again, with questions of scale, I'll just give one statistic and then I'll stop. But if you take Berkeley and UCLA, the two top-ranked public research universities in the country, and you look at the number of students on Pell Grants in those two universities, it's more than the top 15 private colleges in America. That's all the Ivy League plus seven others. It's uh, a question of scale, as we discussed, but even there, the scale is vastly insufficient to deal with some of the challenges we have ahead. So as I've tried to, as I've tried to ask in different points last night and today, clearly I think there are ways in which higher education could become more efficient, could become more effective, weed out some, some real problems in it. But it's also the case that higher education of the scale we want probably involves more investment, more money, right? When you think about what California did with the master plan, California spent a ton of money to build UCSD and UC Irvine when its, when its population was, explosion, was exploding. You said we're stuck. And I think to some extent as a society, we are stuck, right? People really want their kids to get educated. And yet there seems to be no path politically to the idea of building a college system that's actually supported with public money. You all spend a lot of time thinking about dealing with your legislatures. I don't expect you have any magic answers, but how is it possible that public higher education can get to the point where rather than fighting off cuts, it actually is persuading citizens and legislators to invest? What does that look like? I, I I think we just keep saying the same thing over and over again. We've been cut, replace the cuts. We don't package what our capacity is in a way that makes explicit what the return on investment could be. So uh, you could probably say SUNY is really guilty of this as well. We've, we've given all the facts, we've painted the picture. Uh, it seems like the more we increase our enrollments, the more we get cut, there's an inverse <laughs> relationship, but we took a new tactic this year. We set aside a request for an investment of the state of New York in completion. We, all the other things we wanted, innovation, research centers, all the things we asked for, our capital budget, our labor contracts, no, no, no. One thing we can do for you, the state of New York, which is unequivocally answering the degree-ready uh, workforce, which is arguably still the, the brass ring, and we asked for $50, 000, $50 million over five years, $50 million each year for five years. We didn't get $50 million, let alone five years. We got 18, but we've never gotten 18. We've never presented a proposition that gives a quid pro quo to the thing that matters most, which is getting more educated people in the state of New York. So then we took the 18, and sort of like the fishes in the loaves, we added to it, we redirected, repurposed money that the legislature had given us for other purposes that sounded like completion. And instead of continuing to fund the same old programs the way we had done it, we've made it competitive across the 64 campuses. We opened the gates and asked each of the campuses to tell us what their evidence-based intervention, back to what I said earlier, this is a very refined strategy. We got 211 proposals from 64 campuses and many of them were in partnership. 
it unfortunately totaled $480 million. But the point is, we've been able, when you said how can you wean out what doesn't work and how can you go with what work does work in the context of what people perceive as shared governance being an impediment, it is working the other direction. I think we'll go back, ask for, we'll go for 50 million <laughs> again, see if they heard that right the first time. And we are building uh, an accountability system that people can track the progress. And so uh, shamelessly, uh, about six weeks from now, we'll be back in the center with a national conference called Building a New Business Model for Higher Education. And the tagline is Partnerships, Affiliations, Mergers, and Acquisitions. So mergers and acquisitions are a pretty hard thing to talk about in a system like ours because Opening a campus is one thing, closing a campus is almost impossible the mayor without, was the just talking about closing. without the political heft and the support that mergers and acquisitions might bring. So we have to be more efficient, but I guess I'm laying out a profile where we did create an investment fund, we did stake some claims, we did set a number, a target, and we have gotten incredible response from faculty, uh, staff, and students that this is really going to lift all boats. It can be done. Can we talk about that in the context of Indiana? Because frankly, Indiana looks more like America politically than the state we're sitting in or than California, right? And there is a, there is a real sense among large numbers of people, hey, you know what? The economy has been pretty bad now for 15 years. I'm sick of giving the government my money, right? Um, uh, Indiana is sort of a purplish, leaning red state, right? You have one Democratic and one Republican senator, but you have a re you have a lot of the sense that really most states now have today, which is enough with sending our money to the government. Given how many people feel that way, how do you go about saying to people, "Yeah, I know you're frustrated. Yeah, I know you're worried about waste, but this is worth your money. Invest in Indiana University. Invest in higher education." How has that worked for you? Well, well actually, if you're likening uh, Indiana to uh, or being a microcosm of America, then the the the, the future is optimistic because um, uh, this budget session that just finished. Uh, we got a modest but nevertheless significant increase in our operating uh, funds from the state uh, legislature, about 3% across uh, uh, our, um, what, about $3 billion operation in the, in the state, not 3% of $3 billion, but of the operating part the state provides, and about $100 million in capital. I, I think it's, it's pretty clear to the legislature that, um, that education really is uh, a, a, a key way of driving uh, economic growth I in the state. I mean, we, we found that to be bipartisan across all factions. Um, and, and although we, we have to um, heavily focus on issues of accountability and efficiency, and uh, there's a performance metric system that's actually used to allocate some of, some of that funding, overall the climate has, has been fairly supportive for, for higher education. But but I want, if I, if I just could, I want yeah. to do just something that Nancy, with the question you asked Nancy. Um, when you look at the structure of higher education in the state, that when you're talking about how can you actually really uh, build at a, at a scale that the country hasn't built at for decades, probably. Uh, if you look demographically at the state and you were to start today to build a system of higher education, you would probably have many of the campuses distributed differently around the state than they are now. A number of the campuses are in places that were once booming economically and that have gone in decline. Now, obviously, there's still an important need for education there. There are other large areas of the state that um, have grown demographically. The north of Indianapolis, a whole area has grown prodigiously. Uh, but there's no institution of higher education there. We see this as an opportunity to work with the state to actually make the case that if you're to extend educational opportunity in the state, you have to build on the demographics of the state. It's interesting to hear you say that because there, there are a number of other Republican-led states, Wisconsin, North Carolina, where I imagine if we had their, your counterparts there, they would not feel as positive as you do about the level of funding in the state. Do you think that's right? Do you think Indiana is different than a lot of other well, states? Well, I think, I think it's, it's um, people always said that Indiana is sort of one of the last states to go into a recession and uh, uh, one of the last to come out and is, is, has this reputation of, of, of moderation. But I, th I think that, uh, that administrations, I've been there now 20 years, all the administrations, both parties, what is it, five governors, I think, 
have, have all been the great or lesser degree supportive of, of higher education and the le legislature and the leadership has on the whole by and large been supportive. Not extravagant, uh, but, but have, understood the, have understood and agreed with the fundamental arguments and I think that is a great credit for that. And of course the former governor Mitch Daniels is now That's your right. counterpart as I president of Purdue. Charles, you're standing which means we have questions. <laughs> Let me jump in with a couple of questions. Um, there's actually been a number from folks who are perhaps faculty members themselves or are related to faculty members and <laughs> dealing with the frustrations of <laughs> academic life. One, um, a question that came from Paul Druby was, if we talk about student success and graduation, we can talk about programs, but that ignores that faculty are central to this. How can this be reconciled with the adjunctification of the workforce? Adjuncts work hard and can be wonderful teachers, but are too underpaid, too overworked, and aren't long-term enough to be mentors for students through their college careers. And obviously, numbers of universities and colleges are using more and more numbers of adjuncts to staff and teach their classrooms. Well, I, I'll just start with um, one of the things I think we've worked hardest at at the State University of New York is seamless transfer. I was talking to someone earlier. Everybody says they have seamless transfer, but ask the students if they have seamless transfer, and you will find out that it's a pretty rocky road. So we could not have done what we have done, which is guarantee that as an associate degree community college student, you will be a junior at any one of our four-year doctoral institutions and everything in between. It was totally faculty driven. So I just want to say that, that academically, program design curriculum is the purview of the faculty and I think it, it pays huge dividends to be faithful to that model. But, but let, me just say, let me just ask, what percentage for each of you of your classes are taught by adjuncts versus full-time faculty? Oh, it would be in the range of uh, probably 30%, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. is that. And is that true for? I think it's slightly lower than that, but you know there are lots of different categories of faculty, including graduate student instruct instructors who uh, will teach classes at different levels. But see, but the thing about adjuncts yeah. is is that that covers an enormous wide spectrum. Yeah. I mean, we we have the largest med actually the largest medical school in the country, and we have uh, eight medical education centres around the state outside of our main school of medicine. Most of the instruction there is done by adjuncts who happen to be doctors and physicians in the major hospitals in, in those cities. Exactly. And, and there are hundreds of them there. Yeah. So that's very different to, to yeah. this, I, I don't say it's a caricature, far from it, but this, this idea that they're all downtrodden uh, uh, people. I mean, we have my director of communications is here. Um, he's adjunct in our, in our media school that I mentioned before. And so it goes on. I mean, there's a huge spectrum there. I think when, with the, with the questions that I'm reading and when particularly at risk low income students are interfacing with an educational school, that the adjunct that they're dealing with is probably not a clinician or not in a medical school setting. For corporations, there, if a company came and was on the stage and said 30% of our staff are temps, we would be concerned as a journalist and particularly as a society. Are you concerned at all that the number of adjuncts being used to teach classes, core classes, is rising and the and the, what that does to the culture of your university or the quality of education? I think we've tried to distinguish the work of adjuncts. Uh, I think the terminology is bad. Let's just start there. I think uh, a big breakthrough in the professions is to see the term clinician broadly based. But I think we have to re-examine what we call a part-time faculty member, what we task them to do, how we reward their work, but in our system, we have so many different sectors. We have adjuncts also teaching in our high schools. We have high school teachers teaching our college courses, and so I think fundamentally we don't want to lose the balance, which is somewhere between 30 to 70 or 40 to 60. I don't, we don't want to lose the balance, but I do think we could lift up and be more appreciative of the role a practitioner plays. I've heard all morning that we've tailored high schools to certain professions, we're tailoring our community colleges to job readiness. Many, many of the people who are helping with our curriculum work in those industries. So I think we have to sort of recalibrate what it means to be an adjunct, probably change the terminology, probably lift up the quality, and we're seeing activity on that front, certainly at, at SUNY. Are there any questions from the audience? We have a mic coming down to you. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, <coughs> President McRobbie about the extent to which the legislature is supportive of research at the flagship universities. I'm at the University of North Carolina, and I sense 
that our legislature is not enthusiastic about research uh, on the campuses? Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's been supportive in a, in a couple of ways. F firstly, through, um, again, moderate in the scheme of a very large university, but nevertheless increases for capital projects. And um, most of those capital projects uh, are going to support um, uh, research uh, organizations and, and uh, units within the, within the university. Um, we, uh, for example, uh, uh, we've got a significant number of appropriations for buildings in our School of Medicine and the other health sciences schools from the legislature, and they understand that this is focused very much both on the educational side of what they do, but also on the research side. There have been a number of uh, appropriations made to support research, not in a, in a major way. Uh, we have a, uh, a new um, uh, uh, biological research initiative in the, uh, in the state that was, um, that was supported $25 million in the last budget uh, by the state. So it's not, it's not uh, massive money, but it's significant money, and it certainly helps us move the needle in a number of these uh, projects. I mean, again, I think we've made, the, we've made the case for why research has an impact. Uh, I've gone in with um, other presidents uh, around the state, made the case to the legislature. They like to see that unity uh, among the institutions as a very, very effective point politically. Right. But, <laughs> but it's a great question because the, uh, the question of, of, of support for research, especially in the kind of debates that take place around public higher education, are, 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 are deeply challenging right at the moment. Uh, uh, virtually all of the attention paid to uh, the budget wars in California over the last year and the uh, negotiation between the governor and the president of the system uh, concerned uh, uh, the numbers of California students, uh, the efficiency of our uh, educational offerings and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, any kind of uh, inattention to teaching was seen as somehow frivolous, which is to say the research operation didn't even appear except in some sense as an absence. So uh, we have been uh, repeatedly trying to both address uh, state legislators, the governor, the public about how research uh, implies a return on investment that is probably the best investment the state is currently making. Uh, and it's a very difficult argument to make. It doesn't resonate across uh, the kinds of political constituencies now that, that concern themselves. And this is of growing importance, of course, because uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as budgets go down, the uh, University of California overall uh, lost about 30% of its funding in the last 10 years. Berkeley alone has lost 40% of its funding. Uh, where does that federal support, where does the research support come from? It comes from a flat federal budget comes from uh, uh, increasingly from private gifts, uh, contracts, and, and, and grants of one sort or another. Uh, but that, of course, uh, is part of a transformation in the whole funding structure that we're dealing with and in the kinds of uh, gestures towards partnership and uh, how to fund, how to support, uh, how even perhaps to expand some of our great uh, uh, public research universities. Uh, increasingly, we're turning to the private sector in a way to uh, say, you know, you benefit from the training that we give students. You benefit from the research and development that we do. You, in fact, are the primary uh, beneficiaries. And, and, and even in Northern California, where everybody thinks at Stanford that has single-handedly generated the innovation and prosperity of the Silicon Valley, uh, if you actually go down and look and see where people got their degrees, many more went to Berkeley. And, uh, you know, we have 750 graduates of a top three rated computer science department at Berkeley, uh, 225 come out of Stanford. This is not a criticism, it's just about, again, the question of what the impact is overall uh, and what the, uh, what, what the stakes are for states in thinking about uh, uh, the need to support research at the fundamental level. And in computer science, everybody in Northern California understands that, but in terms of basic research. Let me piggyback on there that. There is a you know, kind of public commitment that states and the federal government have had to research that is, we don't know what it's going to be uh, doing it's very hard now to make the case for basic research. It's more important than ever that we do so. What's stolen your money? <laughs> Meaning, as University of California funding has gone down, what, is it because uh, tax revenue has gone down in California, or is it because are there other things where the, the spending has gone way up, and what are those other things? Well, there was Proposition 13. But, but that was a long time ago, right? But it set in motion what everyone knew at the time was going to be a steady problem for funding both education at the K through 12 level and higher education. But the, uh, uh, you know, the, you, you said it last night. Uh, there was a time, uh, I think 30 years ago, when uh, 
2% of the state budget went for prisons and 9% went for higher education. Now, 9% goes for prisons and 2% goes for higher education. There are lots of needs across the state. And I think you know, what we need to be able to acknowledge uh, is we're probably not gonna get a bump back up to the levels of funding that we used to get. We're just not gonna go there. But what that has done, of course, is to mean that flagship universities increasingly, of course, take students from out of their states, we all do this, to pay a higher level of tuition. It's still less than the privates, but it's substantially more than in-state students pay, and arguably, they are helping to fund California students or students from any given state. And of course, in turn, what that does is generate a, a real sense of disenfranchisement on the part of the residents of California who say, look, I can't get my kids into the University of California anymore. They're being taken by people who will pay more. If I pay the same amount as they do, can I get my kid into, and then you get this kind of invidious cycle in which uh, various forms of grievance collect around uh, uh, the kinds of funding strategies that we are adopting per, by necessity. Uh, and so uh, this then in, in, in turn, I think, requires us to, uh, to make a better case for what we're doing, but to acknowledge that we're going to have to seek multiple sources yeah, uh, I, as I, business I, to I step up. I apologize for yeah. that. Let, me, let yeah. me interrupt. Unfortunately, we're out of yeah, time. Sorry. Thank you all so much for your participation and for the panel this morning. Enormously.